Hello again. Hello, Barry. <laughs> we meet again. How are you? Okay. Well, we're okay, talking about this wonderful new album. I've got the two LP vinyl edition, Mirror to the Sky. Uh, mm -hmm. This will be released on the 19th, which is tomorrow, but will actually be today when this video goes out, of course. Uh, there's a purchasing link just below this video. I urge you to check it out. Steve, the first question is, um, it strikes me with this album, there are several whiffs of uh, classic Yes DNA here, harkening back to what many would call that classic 70s sound. Was that a conscious decision to do that, or was it just how the music developed? Yeah, well, it wasn't a conscious decision. It was maybe a natural decision that we would always retain, you know, some yes-ness about us. But no, we're, we're kind of enjoying this, forging ahead with some new material and trying to give it the, the life that, you know, we would have done if we recorded it in the 70s. But we're, we're not in a retro thinking mood. We're really just thinking about really how lucky we are to be able to make music when the technology is just so enjoyable, you know, that, that smooths us along. You know, no more hiss flutter wow very speeding you know i mean everything is is in a wonderful uh domain at the moment audio wise what with dolby atmos so i mean you've yeah. got the record which is a great way to listen because you know there's something about the bass end that's always beautiful on a record and of course this emphasizes billy's great work but also um you know of course dolby atmos you know, is the other end of the scale headphones and you know immersive sound so i mean it's the first yes record like that so you can't blame me for being a little excited no absolutely i think it's a marvelous record to be honest with you um uh the quest felt uh, kind of a gentle and more contemplative record this album by contrast seems much punchier or dare i say aggressive really more mm -hmm. epic uh, did you feel the need to kind of um uh, move away from what you did on the last couple of albums with this one do something different not really, because, you know, you might know that a couple of the tracks actually were, were created during the quest and then um, were never played to the label or never completed then. So in a way, it's a kind of transition that we're, we're sh shunting along with the, with the next project and finding that, uh, you know, th that seems to be the most productive thing we can do. No, no. Um, how did you feel your, see your role um, as role of the producer? How do you see the role of the producer? And as an artist, what challenges were there in producing uh, this album? The role of a producer is just to be the kind of friendly guy who keeps pulling things together by solving all the problems, whether they're technical, musical, financial, you know, I mean, the whole sort of, it, it kind of falls on you. But I mean, it's a fairly natural thing, you know, production. I started learning in 1964 from Joe Meek when I was in his studio and I first I overdubbed my guitar, you know, on a track and everything. It was with Joe. And uh, I guess I was always interested in that backroom guy. Well, as you go through the story of, of Yes, you know, lots of credits saying Yes, produced by Yes, produced by Yes, and occasionally other people like Eddie Offit, who, who was yeah. a great part of it. But, um, you know, I just kept like finding that I, I I wasn't consciously like like looking over their shoulder, you know, seeing what they did. But it was just a natural thing for me to be engaged with the, the guitar sound. You know, I played it. It sounded like that when I, you know, because in the old days you played in the room. And playing a guitar in the room sounds like they'd go in there in the control room. Wow, you know, different, you know. So that, that that was the main thing I wanted to learn, how to get my guitar to, you know, carry through its life, you know, playing, mixing, and then releasing to the public, you know, it, it, in a way where I could steer that a little bit, you know, and I did. And I suppose that's mainly what I thought I was doing, but it wasn't because I always had opinions about everything else as well, you know, sometimes too many. But that... That's just been a learning thing. I've loved that side of, of the work. You know, I guess being beginnings, you know, was the beginning of it when I produced. Well, actually, Eddie produced that with me. And uh, basically, it was the test bed for me to, you know, produce 12, over 12 solo albums. So I think when I said to Yes, uh, you know, back in the 2019, well, you know, we've had other people come in from the outside and they don't always bring what we want, you know. And so I had a good feel. I knew what, what to do. And, uh, the, you know, it worked in the quest. So Mirror to Sky was really just a continuation of a new flow we've got where, yeah, I'm doing the production, but I mean, I, I'm involved with what they do. I'm trying to get what, what they do on, on my music to the highest level, but also I'm trying to get what, what I do on their 
you know, to the level. Yeah. So there's no discrepancy between being a guitarist. I think I just have these kind of domains when I'm in a space. I mean, after a couple of days sessions working with, uh, you know, maybe John or, or Jeff, you know, at the studio doing doing Mirror to the Sky, I suddenly go to Curtis, Curtis Schwartz is our, you know, lifeblood in the technical side, our uh, engineer. So basically I suddenly say, oh, you know what, I've noticed this about the guitars and we hadn't talked about guitars for two days, you know, because all we've been doing was my role was to find out how to get the keyboard or the bass or the vocal. So I enjoy that. Yeah, I really do enjoy it. So it, it, it feels like a natural progression. It's interesting. I'm reminded of a story when uh, Deep Purple were recording in rock and how they were all fighting in the studio to push all the levels up. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's funny, do you get any conflict from the other um, band members to push the drums up or the bass up, or do they relinquish control to yeah. you for that? Fortunately, the, the mixing is is a gradual, like the recording has been done over a, a lot of time when we're not working flat out, you know, on it, we're just kind of coming back to it. But the the, the, the way the levels work is that, that but that they're, they're, they hit, everybody's hearing current versions of the, of the music by the time we get close to mixing. So they, you know, they've already had quite a while to say, oh, you know, when I hear that track, it always sounds like this or, you know, yeah. every, you know. We, that, that there are those conversations you know have you noticed that you know after the second chorus it's a bit like what happened then you know yeah. the kind of comments get thrown in but when you're doing the final mixing i've got the confidence of everybody that they know that we are so close to this you know we're just like this far away from it and they're kind of wondering what i'm going to do to it just to give it that little bit more you know which is definitely what thomas encourages me to do because uh, he knows i i'm never in a rush to finish something you know that there can't be a schedule that makes it worth compromising the record you know like it was in the 70s always you know we had to compromise the tour starting blah 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 and the same with you know uh, around heaven and earth um yeah so basically it, yeah um the production um it just kind of uh meant that we could you know we could agree on things simply if there was if somebody that i like occasionally somebody will notice like a click something that most probably an audience you know the, the public wouldn't wouldn't notice uh mm -hmm. so we check in headphones too because when you hear in headphones you really you can really focus on different sorts of facets of the sound whether it's kind of wholesome whether it's dry you know whether it's uh whether this is hitting you too hard so uh, but we don't mix exclusively in headphones that is a huge mistake i would say to anybody uh the speakers you have to hear it in the room and certainly with dolby atmos that's where you create your impression of immersion so it's very important so yeah the guys stick behind me with pretty much with the mixing if there's something they don't like they can say you know and and there's not there's not often that they have to because you know we're always trying to feature like yes i mean the story of yes where you feature vocals you feature guitar you feature keyboards you feature the bass you feature the drums you know everything gets a look in and that's what that's what we're doing uh, with these last two records and maybe mirror the sky we've, we've got that down even further yeah, absolutely. But you've kind of preempted my next question, really. I was going to ask you about working with Joe Meek. Uh, what lessons did you learn from him? And he strikes me as a a troubled individual, to be honest with you. Did you see any signs of that when you were working with him? <laughs> Look, Joe was a very likable guy. You know, I mean, he was charming. You know, he 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 was he was. Uh, he instilled some excitement in you, you know, when he liked wow. Maybelline. He said, I like Maybelline, you know, we were going to cut Maybelline. Obviously, you know, he was driving that show quite a lot and um, we did it his way. You know, we played it the way he wanted us to, you know, we did all the things he did. So I knew that, you know, for an amateur band, you know, um, you know, the producer was the link, you know, I mean, he was the vital link. And I suppose that continued even like through some of my later 60s records where lucky enough to have great engineers when other people were producing who weren't that experienced. But when it came to Yes and Eddie Offord, then I, I learned a lot from Eddie. I mean, I'm not really, strictly speaking, uh, a, a, a studio engineer, you know. I mean, I work my own studio. That, that's always been what I do. I know my studio really well. Unfortunately, I upgraded it in 2019, which was the best thing I ever did. But I mean, I'm not a computer guy. I, I record on hard drive, but it's all very like, it's almost like recording on tape. So anyway, I keep it that simple myself because, uh, you know, in the technical side, there, there's so much more that uh, that you can do. Um, 
so where were we heading on that question? Sorry, what was your... Oh, yeah, Joe. So yeah. really, it continued. Like I said to you earlier, I did slightly preempt your question. But, you know, Bruce Fairburn, you know, we did the ladder. This guy, wow, he ripped us into shape. He, he I mean, <laughs> he was like the outside producer guy, you know. So that's what's different about the quest and, and, uh, and mirror. But basically, having an outside producer means that, like, okay, okay, what are you doing? Okay, I like that, but I don't like this. Um... Don't do that. Uh, once you do this, uh, and so just kind of stimulating a situation where everybody knows what they're supposed to be doing. That's partly what a producer does. But I mean, more on the ears side of it. I mean, obviously, I come from being a musician, so I mean, my ears are like like fairly <laughs> tweet on listening. You know, uh, yeah. and you know, if I need extra detail over and above what I can hear myself, then it's headphones. But basically, I'd rather hear what the room's sounding like, knowing if if you know the room. So, yeah, very enjoyable side of it. I guess it might be like a musician becoming a conductor, a classical musician becoming a conductor. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, he's been playing like I have, you know, chomping away with the band. And then suddenly the guy finds himself on stage and he's going like, OK, well, let's play Beethoven's uh, <laughs> Third Symphony, but like this, OK? Uh -huh. I'll give you the cues. You know, I, in a way, I can see the I can see the comparison. They're they're very distant in in physical reality, but actually as a concept, they're quite the same. Many people hold up an example of Phil Spector being the producer as artist. Um, would you concur with that? Well, there's many kinds of producers. You know, I mean, Mike Stone with Asia was was just unbelievable on that first album. He was perfect. He was a he was an engineer producer. You know, and he he bossed us around sometimes, but he twiddled the knobs. He did the whole shebang. You know, which was great. Um, so there's really it's very hard to compare. You know, I work with Trevor Horn a lot, and I, I can't compare producers. Yeah, they're very very different. Some of them obviously change. You know, over the years and. Some of them um, do less, actually, you know, hands on, but more of this sort of, if you like, the theatre behind the music, yeah. you know, getting that to be right. So, uh, uh, and some of them, well, you have to have the skill that's most needed in that. And I guess I would cite that with Yes being an international band, you know, with people over here, you know, in a way, if somebody internal to have the, the arms and legs to reach out, you know, through file sharing, Skype, the vid video calls, all, all the stuff that goes with it. Um, that's helped him enormously as any producer will tell you that, you know, his right hand is, is, is his engineer. So having worked with Curtis uh, 20 years, over 20 years before yeah. this all started, you know, so we've had a lot of experience and funny enough, we get on still. Yeah. You know, there's some relationships, we, you know, get tired, but we keep changing. The music we're doing is always different and that's why we keep alive. So it's a fascinating subject. I, I won't rattle on any longer. <laughs> okay. Uh, interesting quote for you. Miles Davis said that uh, don't play what's there, play what's not there. What do you think he meant by that as a musician? Yeah, yeah that's a very inspiring idea uh, because, yeah, I mean, so often, you know, um, I mean, th that is the wealth of stories really in that, uh, you know, I'm playing a guitar on a track, you know, I mean, we won't talk about which track. It could be any track. It could be yes, so anything I've done. And like, you know, I'll fall into something, you know, and that's where I hit that Miles Davis quote, you know, yeah. is this just going to be like, well, there it is, or is it actually going to take the moment and try and do something different with that moment? And I think that's really an inspirational statement, uh, the kind of thing Miles, I think, was quite good at saying, um, as well as I wrote this cheer. <laughs> and he didn't. But, you know, occasionally. So Paul Gill Evans, of course, Gill Evans was 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 one of his blessings. Gill Evans was like his producer, really, and not always yeah. positive enough. So where was I going? Well, that idea that that you you should find something different, and that that's been my the cornerstone of most of my guitar. Because when I started being individual, it was because I said I will not play another blues phrase. Du, 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 du. I'm not. That's out. You know, I can't do that because I was doing that a lot yeah. for many years. And I thought, no, that's just limiting my guitar. There's no need to be in that zone. And when I started mixing from Chet Atkins, you know, inspiration to mix really what kind of guitarist I was up completely, like I don't even know. I mean, I got no idea, yeah, yeah. particularly in the last 20 years when I've been playing steel guitar so much, uh, a bit of pedal steel, but mainly, you know, the steel. 
And that's a very powerful instrument, something I can't get out of a guitar. So all those things have, have helped me move along um, as, as, a, as a guitarist, I guess, most of all. Yeah, yeah. Um, you've just announced the classic Tales of Yes tour next year. I'm hoping that Tales in the title perhaps alludes to my favourite Yes album. Um, well, it doesn't, not... mean, it doesn't mean we're playing all of Tales, but no, we are going to be playing. We, we, we're not really saying, but obviously okay. until we do the show, we're not saying. But there is something about it that certainly is something to do with Tales. <laughs> Probably just me. I, I read that as a kind of a clue, oh, but uh, you're very welcome to interpret it like that, and that that gets your you know anticipation up a little bit. Yeah, um, I was going to say, have you have you knocked the the whole whole album series thing? Have you knocked that on the head now, or do you think there's a chance you might play the Tomato album in its entirety one day? Right. Okay. Two questions there, really. Um, well, the album series idea is definitely not going away. We okay. need a break from it because we didn't. Well, we didn't do it last year. I, well, we did close to the edge. Sorry, having done it in close to the edge, you know, yeah. which really like sealed that that idea. Uh, we thought we were going on to do Relay, but Relay has been like almost like a you know a heavy weight on our shoulders <laughs> these difficult years we've rescheduled that to a well, three times i think so mm -hmm. we've really just dropped the album tour for a while to give us a break and not make us feel like we're only playing real air because we've said for three years we're going to play it you know that that feels in, a bit of an incumbent so we're, we're going to free off that and dream up a really fantastic set that will have some new music and it'll have a little bit of something to do with tales and mm -hmm. it's going to have some shape about it. And we're really looking forward to this, but we're looking forward to it because it's, as I said, it's not something we've been carrying and wrestling right. you know, rescheduling, you know, it's something, it's going to be something fresh. And I, and I think that's what, in fact, even our approach, not that we're going to change our positions on stage, but the approach that we're going to use in our production is going to be quite different too. So, you know, we're certainly not having any spaceships or cows floating across the stage. No. You know, it's less of that and more of the bringing the group really tightly together because we find that when we play closely together on stage without risers, uh -huh. you know, <laughs> something quite clever happens, you know, to us. So we're looking for that uh, closer connection to the, you know, the pulse of the music. Yeah, yeah, well, I'm certainly looking forward to that. Uh... Uh, Sticking with the Tomato album, um, uh, who signed oh, yeah. off the artwork of the Tomato album? And is that person still on your Christmas card list? Okay. <laughs> well, okay. We're jumping in at the deep end here. But you did mention Tomato, and, and yeah. it's a very tricky album. It's, yeah. you know, there were nice things on it, obviously. Great, great songs and, and some marvellous things. But there's a real confusion of what's going on and how we're holding this together and how the hell we play that music again. Yeah. So I would not predict in the near future that this this band it, it would be able to play tomato. Mm. Um, you know, it's it's really been hard work, and it was more or less from when we went out doing it. We were more fluid with it then, and we could play some of those songs, you know, with the familiarity of having just re written them and recorded them. Yeah. But uh, as they got left, and uh, as songs weren't played, the, then the mystery of them sometimes increases, you know, like it does with To Be Over and Sound Chaser, which was a part of the relay we, we didn't play. But having said that, um, Tomato really lacks the polish and the shape and, and the smoothness of, of so like going for the one which has yeah. that with John Timpley engineering for us and things. So going to going to that sleeve, I can't mention that sleeve without going for the one sleeve as well, because they were both done by hypnosis, hypnosis yeah. who were obviously famous for Pink Floyd. Well, I mean, you know, here's yes, establishing Roger Dean, you know, in the mid seventies and Relaya, you know, and then, and then going for the one it's all getting really exciting you know with the, with the visuals and then suddenly you know we we look like a copy band we could be anybody you know uh -huh. you know we could be just anybody i think now they did a nice job and we chose the direction a little bit well the first one we we had choices over what image was going to be on going for the one and we chose that and i asked myself how do we have to chose that to me it doesn't look right even though it is now linked to the album pretty inseparably. And the same with Tomato. Now, the Tomato sleeve, I think you you, you want to give a very brief story about it. Apparently, you know, well, we set them with a task. The album was going to be called Yes Tour, T-O-R. Yeah. 
yeah. you know, you might know what a tour is on Dartmoor and Exmoor. And there's all these things, you know, these kind of little towers. So they went out and photographed them. And, and we said, great, you know, that's what we want. We want a tour on it and some picture of us. So we, we took some pictures in Regent's Park, I think. Yeah. And then, um, you know, they kind of overlaid the tour and the tomatoes. And apparently this is actually the truth. I mean, this is what I understand is the truth. <laughs> They sent it to us and we went, what the hell happened here? So they said to us, look, we overlaid the picture with the tour, like you guys and the tour. And then uh, we dropped a tomato on it and stamped on the <laughs> tomato. And that, 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 that's what it is. Right. <laughs> Somehow we didn't say, get out of here. We uh, want a Rothstein sleeve. You know, we said, all right, okay. And, um, you know, the only bit of cohesion about it is when you open it up, you, you get maps of places like Dartmoor and things with Yes, with yes Tour. And there's actually a place called Yes Tour. So, you know, when you think that Yes Tour is an album with a, with a beautiful picture of Dartmoor, with maybe the band sitting on some rocks, might have been quite cool compared to a Squash Tomato. Yeah. Anyway, all I can say is roll on more sleeves with Roger Dean. And that's why drama, you know, was so important that Roger came back and did drama and um much of what has gone on on after that except yeah. for uh, magnification so there you are quick quick jump into roger dean is is yes's artist and we're so lucky to have him you know, yeah so. absolutely absolutely i mean my last interview with you you said you've been collecting tapes for many many years um I'm just wondering if there are there any unreleased soundboard recordings of the topographic tour tucked away, maybe, and what might there be a 50th anniversary box set or something? Well, it's not in the process at the moment. It it there's a kind of grey area around. I mean, you, you've seen prog prognosis, you know, which I noticed somebody's got a tour called that now. It's a good word. Yeah. My wife thought of it, Jan. My wife, she thought of that word as an album title for you know or something for yes, you know. So prognosis. Um, uh, did that you know with the yes songs didn't it with alan white and and bill Bruford. It, it filled in some of the the the, the gaps if you like but yeah. but um atlantic and water which is now warner brothers would would love to find mine if you got them send them to send them to me i'll, I'll give them to yeah but finding the kind of quality you know is is very unlikely i mean i don't know that we did enough live recording then after all it did take reels and reels and reels of tapes to yeah. record a live show then yeah. uh and but not that that put many people off but if you're doing three tours a year and yeah. you attempted to record three tours every year you know you would end up with with a warehouse full of tapes that somebody's actually got to listen to and yeah, go through yeah. them so you can't do that now you record spot shows you record the highlight show you know the one at you know at, at, at madison square garden or, or albert hall of course those 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 organizations also want to be paid for you to call it that yeah. but that's usually worth it because it is something to say you were somewhere to play you know, instead of the, the back end of you know a border town in in uh, texas or something you're a you know you're a place so um so we would love to find more tapes now i've got an archive which which they've already looked at you know warner's already looked at it when we were doing Yes, live. Yes. Well, I can't remember what it was called, but yeah, I mean, we've done so many compilations. They do. Yeah, there's a series where we did the, the, the Yes, live and Yes, rarities. And um, basically, we, we didn't find any more. You know, there, now there is an archive. Well, it's now been moved to under our, our domain now in, 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 in Mid Devon. There's an archive of Yes tapes. And and I'll just make a note because I mean it's not like if we saw those tapes, they'd already be at Warner Brothers being you know baked and copied and found out what they were. But um let me just make a quick note for, for in case anybody's forgotten that you know live uh, a, a series of live tapes uh, you know from the 70s is is like gold dust, you know, and it would be very, very nice to find more. Certainly would be. I mean, sticking with Topographic for a moment, I mean, do you think that uh, the fact that Rick Wakeman went on to do numerous concept albums after that, do you find his criticism of that album rather odd? You couldn't have hit the nail more on the head because I, <laughs> I often say when anybody mentions anything about a concept, you know, is there a concept? I always say, you know, that he has made one concept record mm -hmm. and the guy that slagged it off the most went on made 10 concept <laughs> records. So <laughs> where's that? At? What does that tell you? 
Um, yeah. We didn't like the criticism that he offered. John and I believed immensely in that record. I mean, immensely. We invested our love and support and beauty and everything we had in Topographic. It was like an enormous, it was like a Titanic of an album. You know what I mean? We we, we just were like floating across this ocean, <laughs> getting very pun ridden here. But yeah. like basically that was, so when, when one of the members actually started moaning about it, well, it wasn't surprising then that he left and we did relay with Patrick Moraes, which was a sensational keyboard appearance. I mean, when you arrive in Yes, like Rick did when he joined, he made a really big presence. And boy, when Patrick joined, he was like well out there. You know, he was a very noticeable, brilliant, you know, musician, and uh, it was very exciting. So yeah, it, uh, unfortunately, what the good news was was that even though there was this, you know, uh, sudden outburst of horror and criticism, you know, it didn't take long before people were saying, you know what. <laughs> <laughs> I like tales, and it became really in to say in the yes world, you know that I loved it. I've listened to it. It took some listening yeah. to, you know. But yeah. I mean, you know, if you just took one and four as as, as the bookends, you know, they are they're pretty big events in, in 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 musical life. But actually, two is really the gem that's kind of hidden. And Rick was very reluctant to to kind of want to improvise when we had these bits called the sea that was going to. Yeah. Yeah. A bit reluctant, you know, needed some encouragement. But um, basically, there's some there's some wonderful things on Tales, and and I will never regret, you know, even a even a bar of it, even the crazy craziness of side three. You don't know what's going on. We did at the time. We absolutely knew what was going on. But that was the the intensity of our musicality at that time. It was it was we could actually cross over from you know. Out in the city, running like almost like a folk song, running free, da, and suddenly we're going. Da, 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 da. <laughs> we're kind of like crazy, crazy men, and then we're we're folk men. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Crazy mixed up band, that yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, talk, uh, back in the day, uh, in the set list, I think they they included uh, the bass Odyssey. Uh, are there yeah. any actual recordings of this? Um, I'm absolutely sure there isn't, which is kind of astounding because there isn't most of other stuff. There was a bit of a mess in recordings when, when unfortunately, you know, Peter Peter left the band and I joined, and there's some crazy mixed up thinking that, well, that's Steve or this is Peter or something. But there isn't a bass odyssey as far as I know because I would spot part of it because I took it from a blues tune called... Um, well, not Stormy Monday Blues, but the West Coast Blues. Oh, no, no, that's a Wes Montgomery tune. Anyway, there's some... Yeah. It's, and I showed Chris this line, and he really liked it, so I played that. Uh -huh. and he played, oh, he played that, and I played a harmony or something. And we actually went crazy on the groove of adventure. There was a bit of that in there, as far as I can remember. But um, much like Chris's other... It was quite like Chris's other um, improvisations that we did over the years. You know, that, um, he, he would want to throw a lot of different things in. Like, you know, when you do the fish, yeah. uh, he, he, he was hard task when when we said we would do a fragile album. Can you do the fish? You know, just just the fish because he was so used to expanding it with bits of other things, and you know, it was a big deal. To, it was really important to Chris, and and, and I go, no, I had no problem with that at all. His solo moment was really important to him. He loved that to bits, you know. He loved to have, you know, the sound, you know, to himself yeah. kind of thing, not with another guitar going. And <laughs> so I, I, I liked him for that. You know, he was a real show off, but he was a real, um, you know, he was really full of excitement for his work. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so the fish. Um, bass, bass Odyssey. Yeah. So somehow, Bass Odyssey. It was almost like it, it kind of evaporated, you know, as we got more material. Uh, and I suppose when we started work on Fragile, you know, everything that wasn't the Yes album and wasn't the most desirable tracks to play from uh, Time in a Word, you know, we, we were almost like a, a, a tortoise shedding its shell, you know, or what, whatever creature shell sheds itself. Many of them do. But basically... Yeah, we were a new band, and particularly when Rick joined, it was another new band. You know, we were in another year. So yeah, that got left behind, and I'm 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 disappointed. You know, I mean, there's a couple of guys 
well, one guy in particular who who loves the challenge, and and I think I'll give him the base odyssey. Find <laughs> uh-huh. these these guys that spend like what, half their lives on the internet, you know, yeah. base odyssey. Yeah, I mean, it would be great. Like like you said, with the other live seventies tracks, to have something that really shows the full extent of what you didn't know about yet. Yeah. A bit like what Miles said, N- not the music you expected, but the music you didn't expect. But also with Miles's thing, you could have said sometimes he was very, he gave great examples of not playing anything. You're going to go, oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay. And he, wait, I mean, that is, that is just cool. You know, that is cool. That's what cool is. Miles Davis. Yeah, he absolutely. was cool. Absolutely. Um, a bit of a silly question for you, really. I'm going to ask you um, uh, what Freddie Mercury was like to work with. And were you ever tempted to join Frankie Goes to Hollywood? <laughs> the, the first one, the, working with Queen was just sheer magic. I mean, it happened by magic, really. You know, I was in a restaurant, saw, a, saw a, Martin, their tech, and invited me down, go to the studio, play the guitar, go to dinner, check the guitar. Um, it was a wonderful experience. Freddie's one of the most wonderful people. It wasn't the first encounter we had. We, 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 well, it wasn't to be the first encounter we had. We had several in the 80s when um, Richard Branston's studio, the townhouse, was very popular with, you know, Asia, GTR, you know, even, uh, I don't know, we might have gone on beyond that. But basically, there was a bit of running in, you know, running into the band. I mean, there was like Asia and there was like Queen in the same studio, you know, having lunch kind of thing. So it was nice to rub shoulders. They always gave us space, you know. Yeah. We never imposed on us and we never imposed on them. But when that opportunity came to play on the record, um, and I'd heard the whole album before they played the innuendo, and then they said, would you play on this? And um, I said, it didn't really need me, but you know, I'll get on board. And it, it's only improvisation. I mean, that is one of the most wonderful things to give, you know. So um, I, I wasn't involved in any part of the construction, but I just played like, you know, on top. And um, I guess that's something that I didn't really know I did at first. It was just something I did automatically. I made stuff up. So it, at first it might have been like really quite naive for me to sort of think that I could make stuff up. But I mean, you just learn how to open that channel up and just improvise so that's all i did i it, th- there was a mention of paco de Lucia, who is the greatest one of well if not the greatest ever flamenco guitarist uh, paco uh-huh. de Lucia. and uh many people love him dearly as i do and uh <laughs> you know if somebody says can you play like paco i said no no <laughs> so i just jumped on board and it was wonderful nice very nice people um your second question was... Frankie Goes to Hollywood. Yeah. No, I wasn't tempted to join them at all. Um, I, I was I was, I was, was happy to dabble, you know, and I was doing quite a bit, quite a few different things with, with Trevor's projects as well, besides Frankie. But no, that was a really nice thing to do. Uh, and when I just was hoping so much that Liverpool, their second album, would, would be, you know, make a, a meaningful dent in the, yeah. in, in the band in the success of the band because it was just great you know and i think they really wanted that because you know there's much more of them uh on that album you know that the, they were set free if you like okay you could play these guys were good you know i mean they're good players yeah. I, I added guitars to various songs on on liverpool but yeah on and a bit on two tribes just mucking yeah. around to see if i could do the bass any better than anybody else but um basically it was uh pleasure done you know that was my main sort of uh opportunity just to wail a little bit just to slide around a bit nothing too outrageous but um yeah i i hadn't been playing the dobro really that long and um of course jerry douglas is the the, the, the supreme artist of the dobro, one of the great supreme if not currently he still is wonderful and um but um so that was a nice opportunity yeah very nice mm. opportunity mm. um i've got one last question for you and that is uh Frank Zappa said that all the good music has already been written by people with wigs and stuff. Do you think there will come a time when there will be nothing original to say in music? No, I think the the uh, in the terms of what we understand as years, centuries, mm. decades, you know, and all that kind of stuff, uh, there's plenty more room for manipulation with the music until we, you know, got to a cliff edge where we said that everything's been done. But the, I, lo- I love Frank Zappa, by the way, but... 
And uh, he was very complimentary about my guitar solo in Paramount Lake right. from tomorrow. But basically, he he was masterful at, at finding those twisty kind of things to say. And what he's right about so much is that there's a wealth of classical music, and, and you know I was pretty in touch with that, you know, from the seventies from the seventies onwards. But to be to be in touch with classical music was a very gradual process that my brother Phil, who passed away a few years ago, introduced me and. When I when I was in a state of mind to listen, you know, I I could see that this is a whole other universe I hadn't I hadn't got to yet, you know, and I think it's something you keep exploring. But the, one of the beautiful things about it that comes back to the wigs and things that Frank yeah. was mentioning is that we, you, you can surmount all the lists you like, the longest list you like of all the yeah. Ragmaninoff, Mozart. I mean, these people are colossal musical yeah. talent. And then you say Bach. Yeah, now, yeah. You see, Bach's almost to the power of 10, if you like. He is 10 of the other guys, you know, built yeah. into one. So I think that most musicians would agree that Bach has some supremacy. Don't know how he got it. Don't know how it was possible. And it was all those years ago. Yeah. Uh, you know, 16th, century, 16th and 17th century, you know, musician. But no, his brilliance shines today. It shone yeah. today on Radio Three. It shines everywhere. It shines all in everything we know. But yeah. that doesn't really diminish from from all the other great composers, and and there are just so many. Uh, and and we, our ears all just tune into the ones we just like. I love John Dowland from yeah. one of the earliest songwriters in 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 Britain, who wrote all the lute songs that we now, you know, draw from. You know, as much as we draw from. Uh, many, many of the other Purcell and um, some of the other great, you know, what some of the, our modern composers have, have written such rich melodies. When you think, you know, what has been written, you know, and what will be playing at, at the proms soon. So I, I'll tune into the proms at, at times and see people. It's always great to see people live. You know, I love yeah. that too. Well, my favourite Frank Zappa quote is, uh, "Jazz isn't dead; it just smells funny," which I think is a wonderful <laughs> quote. Uh, on, I'll end by, as I began, by holding up this wonderful two vinyl set of Mirror to the Sky. Um, it's, avail it's available in a number of wonderful configurations. CD. Will CD. I've got a CD version coming tomorrow as well. Um, I will put a purchasing link just below this uh, video, and I do urge you to, to check that out. Anyway, Steve, thank you so much for this interview. Enjoy the rest well, of your day. Well, thanks, Barry. It's been nice talking to you, and good luck with everybody. Hi there out there. <laughs> thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Take care. All the best. See you. Bye-bye.